Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the fourth installment of As the Prop Turns. I'm going to take a quick minute to introduce everybody. We have uh, Jeff Mesmer, our Vice President of Ranger Tugs and Cutwater Boats. Good morning. Andrew Custis, our General Manager. Good morning. Kenny Mars, our Customer Service Manager. Howdy. Tim Bates, our Delivery Captain and Engine Specialist. Good morning. Brian Dickout, our marketing associate. Good morning. And my name is Sam Bissett, and I'm the marketing director. And uh, there's a, you'll notice there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Feel free to click that. that will open up a box where you can type your questions, and you will see our answers. And we'll do our best to get all your questions answered during the presentation. Uh, for today's webinar, what we did was we took several questions from the Q&A thread that we started last week on Tugnuts that represent the most common questions that we get at the office. And then we built a presentation around those questions. So once we get through that presentation this morning, the plan is to take some live questions if we haven't run way over on time. So um, we'll, an we'll be answering questions on the topic that we're currently talking about during the presentation. So we might hold your question until the end if it's a little off topic. Um, if for any reason the meeting crashes or shuts down, give us a few minutes and check your email. We'll uh, start a new meeting and send out a new invite to everybody. And finally, we will send a follow-up email to everyone within 24 hours of this broadcast. It takes us about a day to get the video on YouTube and to get the question and answer log together and all that. So by no later than tomorrow morning, you'll get an email that will have a video to this webinar and all the important information that you need. There's also pages on the website where you can go back and watch past episodes. Okay, so let's get started here. And now, for the next 30 minutes, as the prop turns, brought to you today by Ranger Tugs and Cutwater Boats, quality cruising and real community. I have no idea why I can't get that stupid bar off the bottom of the video every time. But anyways, the presenters are Tim Bates, Andrew Custis, and Kenny Mars. Go ahead, guys. All right, welcome. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Sam, thank you. Brian, thanks for uh, putting it together. Uh, I'll start off, let's get this going. All right, so I'm gonna, uh, start off kind of at the beginning here. I'm sorry. One second. Hey, Case. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah, we have. Uh, <laughs> We're still our, our, <laughs> our first. All right. Come show everybody your face and then give me time. All right. Say hello. Hi, everybody. What's going yeah, on, Case? All right. We'll see you in a little bit. All right. All right. They got back from their morning walk. All right, let's get going here. So today we're going to do, uh, we'll keep Kenny up, Tim up on uh, video today. We're going to run through, there's uh, the three of us. So we uh, also known as the Three Amigos. And uh, here, if you haven't seen us before, I know you can see us on video. That's uh, uh, Tim to the left. Of course, I'm in the center. Kenny likes to get very He's jealous because I'm, I'm touching Tim a lot. I always have my arm on his shoulder, and you guys get separation anxiety. So <laughs> we we sure do. But, but <laughs> that's a great that's a great photo. That was in Arizona um, when we were all three together. All right. So the first the first topic that we wanted to go through 
um, is AIS. We get a lot of questions uh, about AIS, and we think uh, it's a good one, a good one to cover. I'm gonna I'm gonna share just a different screen real quick, just to show um, another brand. And the big the big reason is a lot of our boats do come uh, equipped with a receive only uh, AIS unit where basically that'll allow you to see all of the commercial traffic, um, you know, fishing, uh, you know, big fishing boats, ferries, tugboats, that type of stuff that'll come up live. And if you do own one of the boats that doesn't have AIS, there is a brand that we have found. Uh, there's a brand that we, we have found that offers a receive only. We got some background noise, Kenny. We're having technical difficulties. Can you hear her? Uh, we got two, we got we got two meetings going on at home right now. Hang on. Just hit your uh, mute button. That's not fun. <laughs> All right. um, but there is another brand because Garmin used to offer what's called a AIS 300. They no longer have that. So let me show you one that's called the. Um, that's made by Cytex in case you want to kind of take notes of um, this one. They, they sell, it's NEMA 2000. We're going to talk about that too, but it's NEMA 2000. So it's easy to install right into the existing um, uh, network. The only thing that if you don't, you did want to add it, you would want to get the, um, the MDA2 and then you'd want to get the MDA3. And that's just the splitter that allows you to tie into your VHF without having to put uh, any antennas on or things like that. So um, if you take a note at the top, Cytex, S-I hyphen T-E-X uh, dot com, and you can go look at the products they offer. All right, so back to it. All right. So again, AIS, this will give, uh, if you do have a receive version AIS, it'll show the, the vessels that are transmitting. Um, and this is kind of a, a simulator mode to show you, but you can see kind of the green triangles. And as you look through your screen, you, you have to make sure it's turned on. And I'll also show you later on in the slides of how to see if you do. If you're unsure if you have that, then you can take a peek and uh, uh, see if it's on your network. Really simple, uh, really easy to do. So um, the first thing basically I'm showing you in this slide is how to get, if you're in a, a standard chart page, you can actually go uh, down to the menu button and uh, click menu, which will bring up a tab on a lot of your newer 7,600, 8,600 uh, plotters, and it'll show layers. Um, and when you hit layers, it'll come up with another tab that shows other vessels. And that's going to be the tab that you're going to go to to make sure that your AIS is showing. Sometimes uh, the default that you would see is going to be um, <clears throat> into, you know, where it's only showing vessels maybe within 500 feet or different areas. So back, I'll go back one slide. So other vessels, then you're going to click over, you'll see AIS, you'll see DSC, some other things. Click the little arrow, make sure that's highlighted with a green showing it, it is on, and then click that arrow there. And that's going to go to give you with your range um, list. A AIS trails is basically if you see one of these, you know, green uh, boats that's transmitting, then you can turn on trails, which will show kind of a trail of where they're going. I, I don't personally turn that on, um, but you can play with that stuff. And so I usually have my display range to show all. Um, and that's the basic, you know, basic way just to be able to get in there to see um, where those AIS uh, boats are. And it's, you know, it's AIS is really helpful to have, um, you know, in, situations, especially in the Puget Sound or maybe some of the river systems or things where you do have commercial traffic. And we have a lot of ferries and barges and things. So cruising up in the islands or around, it's nice to be able to see them around the corner where, you know, radar or similar things wouldn't actually pick up. 
So that just a brief kind of overview on, you know, what you could get for AIS and then, um, you know, how to turn it on and off. And then this will go in, we're going to go into a few other things that have, again, like Sam said, there's, you know, these are several topics to talk about, you know, that we pull off the tug nuts. So the other one's radar. And this, this is an important one because so many people don't run radar until you might actually need it. And I can think of one, our cruise up to, it was either Poets Cove or Desolation Sound last year. And we get out and we get out right in the, right in the straits. And it's just a big wall of fog. And I don't know how many calls between Tim and Kenny and I that we had of, you know, how do I even turn on the radar? You know, I've never, I've had it, never had to use it, but how do I turn it on? So in some of, I think maybe webinar two, when Kenny did his, um, I don't know if we got in, did we get into much radar talk in webinar two? I, Kenny? I got into setting up the radar overlay chart. Okay. And, uh, and just basically, yeah, just the basic functions of, of building that chart and having it ready uh, for that specific reason, especially in the islands here. Right. A lot of fog. Thing, one thing that we always suggest, and I know um, uh, Sam Landsman, he he did a you know, presentation on cruising and you know talked about radar a little bit. And one thing I would uh, suggest to everybody is, even if it's a situation where you don't need radar and you have radar, run it. You know, use that radar when it's light out, when there's no fog, and that way you can play with your adjustments and have it set up to your liking before you get in a situation where you might actually really need it. So we're gonna show you, this is basically from a, a favorites tab that Kenny had set up on his presentation that shows, you know, once you actually put them in, into those categories, you can get uh, radar overlay. You can use that where it overlays right onto a chart. Uh, you could use a full screen radar. I, uh, I'll run both of them just to kind of uh, get myself familiar, but this is going to show you going into a radar and basically how to uh, transmit. So the first thing when you're in a radar overlay and you've created a tab, a lot of the new plotters today will have, you know, quick keys, which is really cool. So, you know, up here on the top where some of the older plotters, you had to go in and uh, tap the power button to transmit or hit the menu and go through several different displays even to just turn it on. So something Gar Garmin's done is put in these quick buttons that'll actually go. And you'll see right here where it says that transmit off. You can just click that on and that'll actually set it up and start spinning up the radar. And once, it, once you do, it'll come up, say spinning up, and it'll pop up with several other adjustments that you can make, you know, right here where um, things like uh, your gain or your, um, you know, weather conditions and wave height and stuff like that that you can adjust. And so once it's spinning up, you'll see this is set up pretty good. And I, I did want to cover this a little bit, um, just about an overlay and how that works. Because so many times I think this is even something we didn't get into, Tim and Kenny on setup is how that overlay when you have an autopilot actually overlays on the land and when you have an autopilot installed it uses what's called a heading sensor and a heading sensor will allow you to it's going to basically give you a more accurate location than your gps would when you're running an overlay and so you can see a little bit on this where, you know, maybe Kenny was cruising up north or heading north and you can see the overlays not perfectly on the land over here. And usually that's an indication, which we'll get into maybe in a webinar down the road, how to calibrate autopilots and make sure those are, are done as those should be done really in different areas of where you boat, depending on where the boat ends up in the world. So Back to, that's just a little bit of a side note, but back to it, you'll see we turned it on. You see an actual, looks like this was actually a, uh, maybe uh, some sort of, what was that, Kenny? It's, it's one of the markers when they do the sailboat races that they have between us and Vashon. 
So it's, it's, uh, it is actually labeled on the chart, but yeah, that's, it's just when they do their races, they go back and forth and uh, that's one of the ones that go around. And you can see too, when that, when that, you know, shows up on your radar overlay, it's pretty darn close to that marker. So, you know, that, that side of things, it'll show, you know, markers, basically anything with the, you know, that might have some metal or a solid kind of barrier to it that it'll pick up. But this is nice because you can cruise, be able to see, you know, right on your chart where those are. And then as you come in, we wanted to show you different things of how to adjust. So it's really important to know, you know, maybe, you know, where your gain is set up. So whether your gain is high or your gain is too low, this is kind of going to show you different screens of where that is. So this is set, once he hit that gain button, this shows kind of where it was. It was between 50 and 60%, which had a pretty good, you know, detail. It showed up on the land good. It showed up over on that marker well, and it didn't have too much clutter that was over here. This might have been some clutter that shows up towards the bottom there, but you can still adjust and really tweak that to uh, your liking. And, and those adjustments will change depending on weather. You know, if you have, you're in rough water, you, you'll have to get in here and change some of your wave heights and maybe adjust that to turn that down. Um, but this shows in that 50 to 60% range. When you come up here, you look at, we adjust the gain way up and you can see that that's not gonna show you anything. Um, that's gonna just put, you know, all sorts of interference out there to where you're not gonna have an idea if that's a boat or a marker or whatever it is that's out there in the water. Where if you turn it down too low, you're not gonna get anything. You'll see that it, it's not picking up that marker now. So you wanna make sure to use that bar and adjust your gain to where you're picking up items that you can actually see or, or boats that you can see in the water to make sure that's displaying right. I think one other good thing here too is at the very bottom of the screen, you'll see your, your ring uh, distance and then your total distance. So as you zoom in and out <clears throat> from the screen, um, it's, it's good to know as you're practicing with this um, and trying to judge the distance of other boats or markers uh, to see, okay, what's my total distance, which I can see I'm at, you know, a fourth of a mile. And then what is each ring telling me for a distance, which that's at an eighth of a mile. So as you zoom in and out, you'll also have to kind of adjust your gain during that time too. Yep. And you'll be able to know. So from the boat to the top ring right here, Kenny. Yep. That's a quarter mile. That's an eighth. That's an eighth. That's and then your, every your, ring past that is an eighth mile. Exactly. So your total distance would be <laughs> of, of what you're seeing on the screen is a quarter is mile. Is a quarter mile. Yep. Perfect. So this is back again. You can kind of see Kenny just put it back up here again where it's in the, between that 40 and 50%. And another, another one that we use a lot, this is from a full screen radar. Now I did do this, this picture slide that was on a trailer. So it's pretty tough to be able to see there's a lot of stuff around where the actual boat is. But what you can do is there's a uh, feature that you can actually acquire target or it's called a MARPA target to where if you're out cruising and let's see, you know, let's say this is a ferry boat here, something that you want to monitor and kind of see. Because if you have a route up, a lot of the time when you do your MARPA targets, it will actually track and monitor that target and lock on. So if it gets within your, your range or distance or your route, it'll actually warn you, which is really nice. So it's kind of fun to be able to play with it and um, figure out you know, what those different settings do. But again, do it during the day, do it when there's no fog. And that way you can play. And when it does come time, if you have to cruise at night or you do cruise at night or you get stuck in the fog, you're going to be educated on how to actually use that. So basically open up your, um, I, I always, I tend to use an actual radar display or I run a split screen a lot of the time if I'm using radar. Um, but you can use the overlay too. And so all you do is you basically touch the, the boat or object that you want over here, put your cursor on it. And at the top, you'll see this button that says acquire target. And once you hit that acquire target, it'll come up 
and it'll actually track and it'll give a number to that. So you can have multiple targets to where all of a sudden I have this, it's actually going to show uh, if it's a moving object, it'll show you the direction that object is going. So you can get a good idea on the position too, if it's coming at you and you can't see it. But you could go over here and let's just say this was a cargo ship and this was uh, uh, Kenny and his little aluminum boat over here. He was out fishing. You could go and actually set multiple targets so you could see right where everybody is. So that's a, I, I use that quite a bit, especially if I'm in fog or anything else. And it's nice when we're cruising in groups, like we're going up to poets or any of that, you can set behind you too. And it helps just identify all the boats that are cruising with you and just makes it really visible to be able to see. The next section, and we'll go through kind of at the end, just so everybody knows of these uh, sections that we're covering is uh, with questions too, but is NEMA 2000. We get a lot of questions on, you know, what, what is NEMA 2000, how it works, um, you know, what, you know, the install, basically NEMA 2000 is, I like to, I like to consider it like, you know, a, a, almost like a USB device that you could just plug in and it recognizes and you don't have to do any real hardwire connections other than power. And I've created a little bit of a drawing just to give an idea, but this is useful because we do get calls a lot on, you know, maybe my, um, what was one? Oh, I, I, I was uh, uh, talking to one of, we were putting in getting a boat ready and they had questions on the VHF wasn't showing uh, its position data. And so the first step, a lot of the time, if you have questions about a NEMA 2000 device, uh, that's installed, or maybe you don't know if it is installed, you can actually look and see if the chart plotter recognizes what is on that NEMA 2000 network. And this shows you how to access, and you can do this pretty much from the, the way we have our slide is set up um, for a 7600 series or an 8600 series, which uh, Garmin chart plotter, which you know, some of the, the to access those may be on a 5000 series or a 7200 is different, but you can still access because they're NEMA 2000 capable. But on this, from the home screen, you go into settings and it doesn't matter if you're on any one of these, um, you'll, as long as you're on a home uh, type page, go into settings. You go into communications because that's um, what is going to read on the plotter. And then you go into NEMA 2000 setup. And then you'll see two things, label devices or device list. Device list is what you're looking for. And that's going to read the different devices that are actually uh, connected into that system. And it's good to know what, what those actually are. So this boat that I was on showed this device. It had an 8616. Um, XSV, which means the XSV uh, portion is everybody in their boats that has a newer one has an XSV, which has built in sonar. And then it has a reactor, which is part of the autopilot, and then the GHC 20, which is the autopilot display. Keep in mind, whatever you're reading in this NEMA 2000 devices, you'll notice there's a lot of things that aren't on here, and that's because I didn't have them turned on. So once I would turn on an engine, if it's a Yamaha or a Volvo um, or a Yanmar or any of those that's hooked into NEMA 2000, it would show and it would say uh, Volvo engine or it would say uh, VHF radio. I didn't have the VHF on when I went through this. So you'll be able to see what those devices are. And really there's not much settings that uh, you can change it's just more of knowing what is hooked into that network. And then this coming up is a basic, you know, diagram of how the NEMA 2000 works. And so Garmin, yeah, most, most manufacturers of, of all electronics have either NEMA 2000 or similar, but Garmin uses basically these T's and all these T's just plug in and screw into each other. And each T is going to feed a device. 
And so you'll see anything that's connected to this network will display or talk between the, the chart plotter, the VHF, the uh, fusion radio, the autopilot, and then whatever engine you have installed that's there. The other part that's important to note, because if you ever go in to this page, back one, one page here, if you ever go into that NEMA 2000 devices page, and let's just say it said none found, the first step that I'm going to do is check the power. So there, a NEMA 2000 network has to have power going to it. And so typically you have, uh, basically it's a yellow cable that comes off of what we call this backbone. And that yellow cable comes off of it and it goes to power and it goes to ground. And so the first thing there is, what I don't show in here is there is a fuse that protects that. And so if you got a none found, the first step is I would wanna make sure that fuse is okay. Um, that powers that NEMA 2000 network. And you know, you'll find that too in your fuse block diagrams where it would show a three amp fuse for your NEMA 2000 network to see it. And then on the end of the backbone, you have to have a terminator. And so they basically have a terminator at the end of the branch, which this might be different when you have a flybridge, um, you know, or you have multiple stations because basically it, it can get kind of confusing, but this entire backbone you can have an extension that goes on here that actually runs up to a separate backbone. And then this terminator would be on the other end of that backbone. So there's lots of things to learn, but this is kind of a basic to be able to get in there and look at and see what you actually have installed and what's communicating to make sure everything's functional. The other side of that, so I took you in um, before in a slide uh, prior to that, where we went into NEMA 2000 setup. The other end of this that we do get a lot of calls on too is, you know, maybe they're going into NEMA 2000 setup and you don't see a device um, such as sonar or radar. Garmin uses what's called a marine network in addition to uh, NEMA 2000 setup. And on the marine network, you're gonna have devices, uh, some of those network devices might be uh, another chart plotter where a chart plotter would network together. So just to give you an example, um, this boat that I was on was a sedan. So it didn't have a second plotter up top, but if you did have a command bridge, when you go into the network, you should be able to see, you know, just to give you an idea on a 31 um, command bridge, you would have an 8612 that would recognize on this list as well. You know, or if you had an older series uh, Garmin that didn't have the sonar built into it like the S XSV would have, then it would show up on here and say, okay, I recognize a a an additional sonar box. So it's good to check those things too to see what's there. But in this specific boat, the only network device that's really showing is the radar. So you know it's connected and you know it's actually seeing it. So two tabs that allow you to see the different devices that are actually plugged into the Garmin network and NEMA 2000. All right, so that gets through kind of those um, slides. I don't know if uh, Jeff or Sam, are there any specific questions that my Brian that have come up? Um, that we should talk about? Sure. Uh, I'll start at the bottom here. Uh, Rocky says, if that fuse is bad, will all the NEMA 2000 systems be down? Yes. Yep. So if you don't have power going to the NEMA 2000 backbone, then it won't allow anything to recognize on the Garmin. The Garmin will still work as long as it has power, but it's not going to see any of those other devices. Um, this, is, this is a good question. Hopefully you didn't cover it. Uh, how to stop AIS notifications when heading out of a marina? Yeah, that, that is a good question. Um, I, I personally, I'm, I'm you know, probably guilty of this, but a lot of the time, when you head out of a, a marina and there's 50 different uh, boats that are transmitting AIS, 
it will give you basically an alarm that pops up that you can change alarm and you can set your distance on AIS. So if you, you know, you wanted to be where it only alarmed you at 500 feet, I, I personally turn that alarm off. I go to always off um, just because I don't like getting all the notifications that pop up on the plotter. And, you know, I can see those real time. It just doesn't alarm me um, as I'm cruising, but that's something each person would have to decide. I think it's underneath uh, collision alarms in the alarm section that Kenny covered last week or two weeks uh, ago. Gotcha. So webinar, webinar two, you can look at that too to see the different collision, how to select the uh, set the arm uh, alarms. Jeez, Louise. Very captivating footage on that uh, yeah. that webinar series. <laughs> Love that. A lot of lot of kid info. Um, <laughs> Definitely top three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Marie's got a question about radar. She says, can you talk about timed out or timed something? I think she can't remember exactly what it says, but can you think of an alert or something? It's maybe an error code that's come up on the radar. Okay. I think I, the only thing I can think of is if you're getting some sort of, usually it'll have an error code that came up if you did have a problem with um, radar. And one of the first things that we have done for for all boats if i ever get any alarms the first one i want to do is check the outside connections at the radar unit because garmin which is really cool unlike some manufacturers they put their network connection because we talked about the garmin being on the marine network so a network kind of looks like an ethernet plug um, or a phone jack style and you can unscrew it right from the external of the radar and you can go and basically clean those terminals but what i've seen in the past is if people trailer their boats or those radars don't sit up there's a possibility you can get a little bit of water or things inside that connection that you'll want to clean on power or network and then if that didn't work then uh, i would call garmin and talk to them about what error code is showing and they'd be able to suggest kind of that next next step and, and before you power off the chart plotter like when you're done for the day it's important to make sure that you actually go in to any of your radar screens and and turn it off or put it to standby before you just kill power too um uh, you know if you turn the plotter on again sometimes you'll have an error because it's just like turning your computer off or shutting it down um it's good to make sure that you actually properly shut down the radar too yeah, and I think one one thing, I don't know if you, did you talk about updates in your captivating webinar number two? Rich and captivating webinar. Uh, we didn't dive into it, but we did, we did put the link because um, we had the link on how to update software, that little DIY one we did at Trawler Fest a couple years right. ago. So we did add that to the end of my webinar. And I would, the only thing I would add to that in, in troubleshooting and Garmin, you know, Garmin is a software based company. So a lot of their stuff can be fixed by updates. So if they've had, you know, things where they've noticed, you know, different NEMA 2000 sentences or things like that, they can actually fix those by an update. So I would just make sure you have the latest update. Uh, before you call them as well, because it's most likely the first question they're going to ask. Yeah, I was going to say they won't even start troubleshooting with you until they know the software version. Right. Yep. Yeah. Andrew, one thing that uh, Charlie brought up and that I've found, he uses Marine Traffic, which is an app uh, for your phone, and it has AIS. And I use uh, Ship Finder uh, on my phone, which I find really handy, and that, that gives it right on your smartphone. Absolutely. So if you didn't, so that would go into if you didn't have AIS and you didn't want to go through installing a Cytex or an aftermarket brand, then you could just download it right to your phone, right? Exactly. Perfect. And can you put that on like your iPad or tablet or something like that to where you could have it as kind of a separate monitor? You can, yes. And it's That's nice to you know, if your Garmin's off and you're just uh, sitting in the cockpit of your boat, you can actually see what's going on around you. Um, or if you're at home, just seeing what traffic's out there, it works well for that. So, 
Does that, just curious, because I haven't used many of those, does that device, tablet, phone, does it have to have GPS? Uh, most of the phones have GPS now. I don't know the answer to that for sure. It does need a cellular connection. Okay. Yeah, you can see that's the boat watch one right there. Got it. So you can still zoom around and zoom in and, and same kind of thing you were doing on your screen is tap on them and, and get the info. Gotcha. Okay, cool. We've got uh, lots of other questions, but we'll have to take some of these offline and uh, let's, let's keep her moving. Okay, I'm going to stop mine and Tim, you're up. All right, let me share my screen here. So Andrew talked a little bit about uh, radar and what's around your boat. This next section, we're going to talk about sonar and kind of what's below the boat. Uh, first thing we're going to do is check a couple of the settings for the sonar. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about the transducer and making sure that you have the, uh, the correct fluid inside of the transducer cup, um, how to check that and, uh, and how to fill if needed. Uh, so very first step here is from your home screen. Uh, you know your home because you see the home up in the upper left. You can click on the sonar tab over on the right. Uh, once again, this is the uh, Garmin 76 and 8600 series chart plotters. Um, but regardless, it's always going to be your sonar tab. So once you've clicked on sonar, that's going to bring open the, uh, the sonar options here. There's really three options. There's the traditional, which is a full page sonar screen, the split zoom, and the split frequency. Uh, both the zoom and the frequency settings we're going to talk a little bit about. Uh, here in the next couple slides, but uh, for this first one here, we're going to go to the traditional tab, which is going to be a full page traditional sonar screen. So just like uh, Andrew's presentation there, this boat was on a trailer, um, so you're not going to get good depth readings anytime the boat's out of the water. Um, but with the boat in the water, what you would normally see is your, your depth up here at the top left, and then you would see the sea floor down here uh, you know, wherever, wherever that's at. So it could be, um, you know, bright red, just like your radar, anything solid is going to be that red color there. Uh, next step here is to hit the menu button, which is right down uh, next to the home button. That's going to bring up our settings. So the first setting here to check is that the transmit is set to on. Um, you know, if the transmit's not on, you're not going to have any depth here. You're not going to have any image here. So you definitely want to make sure that you're transmitting. Uh, what that's doing is it's taking the transducer and it's shooting a beam down through the bottom of the boat and, uh, and looking for the bottom. Next one here is your frequency. So depending on the year of your boat, it's either going to be a, um, a chirp transducer, which we're going to talk a little bit about the differences of the frequency here, but it's going to be a chirp transducer, um, or you're going to have the option of 50 hertz or 200 hertz. Um, if you have the chirp technology built into your transducer, that's the one that we recommend uh, you use. It's kind of a, a mixture of the 50 hertz and uh, 200 hertz. On the next slide here, we kind of talk about what the differences are. Um, so any of the Garmin transducers, if you, if you look at the transducer on your boat and it says Garmin on the top, um, or if you go back to that screen that Andrew was showing you, um, where you can see the different devices, you can see what kind of transducer you have on the boat. Um, if it has the option for Chirp here, then you have a Garmin transducer. Um, I think we started installing those in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. But there are several different types of transducers. The most common in our boats are going to be uh, either a Chirp transducer or a 50 hertz or 200 kilohertz uh, transducer. Now the 50 kilohertz transducers penetrate deeper into the water, uh, but give you a little bit less detail. So maybe better for cruising if you're just really trying to get those, uh, those depth readings, especially at speed and deeper water. Um, that's going to give you a little bit better depth reading. Um, if you're fishing, maybe you're focused more on the detail side of things, then you would go to a, a 200 kilohertz transducer setting. Um, that's going to give you some more detail. Um, CHIRP stands for Compressed High Intensity Radiated Pulse. Um, that kind of transducer is going to basically be a combination uh, of both of those different kilohertz that you see up above. 
Um, so if you have the option, chirp is kind of the, the way to go. If not, then you can select either 50 or 200, uh, depending on how you're boating that day. So the next option here we're going to talk about, or the next setting, I should say, is going to be zoom. Um, typically, you're going to want to make sure that your mode is set to auto. And what that's going to do is it's going to shoot that beam down from the transducer, find the sea floor, and then show you everything in between the bottom of your boat and the sea floor. It could be a couple hundred feet of water. It could be 10, 15 feet of water, depending on where you're at. Um, but when it's set to auto, it's going to find that sea floor and show you everything in between. If you go to set zoom, um, if you're downrigger fishing, if you're doing any kind of fishing, and maybe you only want to monitor the first uh, 66 feet of water or wherever your downrigger set at, you can go through and you can set that zoom. And it won't show you the overall depth. It won't show you where the seawater floor is, uh, but it will show you in high detail uh, that first 66 feet. So it's really nice if, like I said, you set a downrigger to 50 feet, you want to monitor that first uh, 50 to 75 feet to see kind of where the fish are at, what's going on, uh, you know, at that depth, you'd want to set that not on auto, but set that to the, uh, you know, the foot that you're looking for right here. So this is a picture of the current transducer that we're using. Uh, it's the Garmin with Chirp technology. Um, the biggest thing here for whenever you're installing these transducers is that you prep the surface correctly. So it needs to be on an unpainted surface uh, directly on the bottom of the boat. It's not a drill through tr style transducer, it's a glue in style transducer. So uh, the way that those work is that we sand and prep the whole bottom here. Um, and then you use a um, basically a marine adhesive and a marine sealant to glue that cup to the bottom of the boat. Uh, it's really important that that glue covers the entire area that you're gluing uh, in the cup there. Um, you can see that there's a couple different ways on these transducers where the fluid inside of the cup can, can, uh, can leak. Uh, one would be on the bottom where the cup is, you know, glued to the bo uh, bottom of the boat. The other is through the O-ring here where the transducer actually installs into the cup. Uh, if either of those two are leaking, you're going to lose this fluid inside of your transducer and uh, you're going to get uh, sporadic depth readings or maybe no depth reading at all. Uh, I'd say the biggest fix that we have, you know, with our, with our local owners here is you need to add fluid and uh, most likely it's that you have a leak somewhere. Uh, we prefer to use the pink RV antifreeze for a number of reasons to fill the cups. Uh, number one is that it doesn't evaporate, um, it doesn't freeze, but also it's a bright pink color. So if you see any of that fluid around the transducer, uh, it's really easy to know, okay, I have something going on here. Um, I need to check the O-ring, I need to check the, the seal on the bottom of the transducer. Um, another question we get a lot is, you know, how much fluid do I put in there? Um, whenever we install the transducers, we just fill the cup all the way. So fill it up to the top. You know when you put the transducer, you know, inside of the cup, you're going to lose a little bit of fluid, um, but that's okay. That'll ensure that, that that fluid level is all the way up to the top of the cup there. Um, this style transducer has six screws, just fill up screws that uh, secure it to the cup. Some of the older style Airmar transducers that we installed for a long time were just a single uh, rotation. So it was about a quarter turn twist to the right to tighten, quarter turn twist to the left to loosen and remove that transducer. Uh, one other thing to note here is anytime you reinstall the transducer, you want to make sure that the keel tab up here on the, the arrow is aligned with the keel tab on the cup. This should be uh, pointed right towards the keel of the boat, um, especially if you're installing a new cup, you want to make sure that this is pointed right towards the keel. Okay, stepping away from transducers in depth a little bit, we're going to talk uh, about anodes, um, better known as zincs, and the bonding system on your boat. Um, so anytime you see these large green wires here, those are going to be bonding wires on the boat. Not to be confused with the, the green grounds on your AC electrical system. Uh, these are a larger gauge uh, bonding wire. And what they do is they protect any of the underwater metals on your boat that we don't attach as zinc. Uh, so for instance, the rudder here, we don't have any zinc uh, attached to this particular part of the boat. What we do is we take a, a bonding wire and we attach that to the rudder. And then that runs over to a, a location where there is a, an anode attached. Um, for the rudder, it just so happens to be right next to a transom anode. 
So we run that over and then the transom anode over here will protect the, uh, the rudder here from any kind of underwater electrolysis. We also run that transom anode uh, bonding wires up to the through holes, um, up to the drain plug, basically any of those metals that we can't protect with an anode or better known as a zinc, uh, we use that bonding wire system for. Okay. Just a close up. Hey, Tim. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> I was just going to hit on a couple real quick on the transducer. Yep. Um, we had a few questions there that I just wanted to just kind of answer. And um, one of them was, you know, why don't we install a through hole transducer? Um, and the other one, which is kind of in line with this, is, uh, you know, how do you get seawater temp? So I think the biggest reason we don't install a actual in water or through hole transducer is because, you know, our boats are trailerable. Um, so you have to be careful of, of not hitting that, that transducer on the bunks or rollers as you um, are launching and retrieving. And especially on the diesel side, um, you know, your transducer has to be in front of all that prop wash. So if it's behind it, you're, you're not going to get any sort of reading whatsoever. So um, being that our transducer is not physically in the water, that's another reason why you wouldn't necessarily have water temp available either. Sure. So, yeah, it, it, an issue there, you know, and you have a, a four inch hole in the bottom of the boat, it's definitely a safer way for us to install uh, a transducer on the models and get, you know, get good accurate depth readings uh, without that risk of, you know, salt water intrusion or, or just water intrusion on the boat. Yeah, and I think for guys who are doing some serious fishing, um, you know, our customers doing serious fishing, I know like, you know, Vic on his 29, he installed a, a crazy aftermarket transducer from Garmin. Sure. Um, but he, he's going to Alaska. He's doing a lot of fishing. Um, so he, that's why he kind of upgraded that on his boat, which, you know, you can, you can certainly do. Um, but you know, just for basic depth reading and fish finding, you know, this is why we kind of went with the, the shoot through style. Sure. So I just want to answer those before we got too far away on the, on the, uh, transducer section. So okay. take her away. Perfect. Okay. So what this is, is a, a close up version here of, those bonding wires uh, gives you a little better look at what's going on. So these two bolts are leading to the transom anode. This happens to be on a 31 again. Um, so there's, a, there's an anode or a zinc on the outside of the boat. And we connect all those bonding wires right to the stud on that anode. That way that anode on the outside of the boat is protecting everything here that's, uh, that's connected on the inside. So this one down here actually is your your transom anode, it goes up to uh, kind of a multi-meeting point here, up to stern rails, it goes up to the rudder, um, down to the drain plug, any of those metals that once again, we can't protect using an anode. So next we're gonna talk a little bit about how to kind of protect those anodes, how to make those anodes last a little bit longer. Um, the very first thing that you need to do is, is monitor how long your anodes are lasting. Um, it can definitely vary um, not only by location, but marina. Um, you know, you hear the term uh, hot marina a lot, and that all refers to the amount of electrolysis or electricity that's flowing through the water. Um, it has, you know, everything to do with your neighbor's boats to the marina's wiring, um, to how well it's protected on the marina's wiring. Um, so one thing you can do is install what's called a galvanic isolator, which is gonna help protect your boat anodes um, when connected to shore power. It's, a, uh, it's an isolator that will protect and isolate the ground on your boat on the AC side of things. Um, that way you're not sharing a ground with you and each of your neighbors. Um, some of those boats that maybe aren't as, as protected as ours um, without an isolator, their, you know, their systems can be using your system to protect uh, themselves. So what this does is it isolates the ground to your boat. Um, anytime you see that your anodes have deteriorated below 50%, you want to replace those. So it's really important when you first get the boat to make sure you inspect those anodes. You, you see what they look like brand new. You know what they, they look like when you start. And then once they get down to about halfway um, gone or halfway eroded is when you want to uh, either get a diver out to replace um, or, you know, pull the boat out, clean the bottom and replace your zincs. Um, so as far as the installation on a galvanic isolator, it's very simple, very easy. Um, basically, all you do is you interrupt the ground coming from the shore power, shore power plug uh, in between the plug and the panel on your boat. So they always want them as close to the plug as possible. Um, and all you're doing is you're taking, a, you know, one side of the ground coming from the, the back of the plug, connecting that to the isolator, 
the other side of the isolator goes over to the AC panel. Um, we usually just take the 110 wire on the back of a plug and we'll cut the ground and then connect two wires going straight down to uh, the isolator itself. Um, we do stock these. You want to make sure when you purchase a, an isolator for your boat uh, that it's the correct size. This one happens to be for a, a 31 Northwest edition uh, with 30 amp shore power service. So for the 30 amp boats with only one single 30 amp plug on the boat, you would use the ProSafe uh, FS30. If you had maybe uh, a 50 amp service on one of our 41s, you would need a 50 amp. Um, if you had a uh, luxury edition boat where it had two 30 amp plugs, you could either do two galvanic isolators or a ProSafe FS60, um, but definitely make sure that you're ordering the correct isolator for your boat. Uh, anytime you want to order these, you can just shoot an email to parts at rangertugs.com uh, and we can ship those just about anywhere. So here's a picture of the transom anode. Um, the transom anode, unlike the isolator, is going to be uh, basically another thing that you can do to protect the boat at all times, not just when you're plugged into shore power, uh, but even when you're out on anchor, um, you know, if you're at the dock without power plugged in, uh, this is an item that if your boat doesn't have, you can add to protect those other zincs on your boat. Um, the way that they work is we, uh, we drill two, two studs through the back of the boat, like you saw on the previous slide, and then you want to make sure to seal those. Uh, the anode connects to those bolts, and then you'll have a couple bolts on the outside or nuts on the outside that will hold that in place. Uh, if, you're not, if you're not intending to install a transom anode, if you don't want to drill holes through the bottom, you know, bottom back of the boat, one thing you could do is what's called a grouper zinc, like you see down below. Um, I've heard lots of different names for those, towfish, uh, grouper zincs, guppy zincs. Uh, what that is is a quick, you know, install, quick detach zinc that you can install right to the bonding system. Um, I've heard even, you know, connect to a, you know, an engine mount. Anything on the, the bonding system side of things, all you do is you hook up the clamp over on this side to it, and then you drop this zinc in the water. Um, that's going to be basically doing the same thing as this transom anode without needing to drill any holes through the boat. Uh, it's a big one to make sure you pull that one up out of the water before you leave the dock. Um, that's one thing I've heard of before is, you know, you get in a hurry to leave the dock and you forget to disconnect it. Um, Andrew had mentioned on his boat, what he did was he actually had a stud uh, that was in a good location uh, up, up above the deck that he was able to hook the clip to without having to open up hatches or, um, you know, get down below any of the deck, deck uh, lockers there. So with that, all you do is hook up a stud, convenient location, and then connect a bonding wire down to the existing bonding system. So this next slide here, we have a couple pictures of a 31 that spent about a month in the water down in our factory delivery center in, in Des Moines. Uh, you can see they're already starting to deteriorate a little bit. They were brand new when we put them in. Um, picture on the left here is your thruster anode. It is this section right here that's held in place with a single um, Allen bolt. And over on the right, we have the propeller zinc. Um, this is a big discussion on tug nuts, so how to keep these guys on there. Um, what you can see is that it's also held in place with an Allen bolt. And um, you know, as the, as the zinc wears or as it deteriorates, what can happen is, is that the zinc starts to get eaten up around this bolt. And then when you run the motor, these zincs can easily fly off the back of the boat. Um, so what we do is we actually install a fender washer here. Put a, put a big fender washer there. It's a 5 16 bolt, so you'd want to get a 5 16 fender washer, then a lock washer, and then just a standard hex head uh, bolt. If you throw a little bit of blue Loctite on the threads of that bolt, that will also help to keep the bolt in place, um, and you'll see that zinc stay on there uh, for quite a bit longer. Here is that same boat. This is a picture of your trim tab anodes. So the trim tabs have a zinc on top of the tab, but also the exact same zinc on the bottom side, and then a bolt that passes up through the bottom zinc in the tab and then threads into the top side zinc. Um, so just like I said before, this boat had been in, you know, been in the water for about a month, um, and I'd say you're probably already 10 to 15% uh, deteriorated there. Um, so, you know, you're not quite ready to replace at this point, but absolutely starting to see some effect of uh, that electricity flowing through the water. This next slide are brand new zincs. 
So over on the, uh, the left here, we have a brand new propeller zinc, brand new transom zinc, and then brand new thruster, or, um, trim tab anodes. Um, so one thing to note here, it's very important to remove the stickers from your zincs or your anodes before you install them. Um, if you don't, then this entire section of the anode isn't working. So eventually they would deteriorate and fall off, but uh, good practice just to pull the stickers off. Um, I've even heard of some people doing a light sand on the zinc before you install it on the boat. Moving away from the inboard boats uh, to an outboard, this is going to be a Yamaha 200 outboard engine zinc. Uh, the 300 outboard will be very similar. Uh, it looks a little bit different where it has kind of a little, um, you know, an angle here. But as far as installation, it's identical. Um, this is what's protecting your main engine from electrolysis. Uh, on the outboard boats, this is by far your most important zinc. Um, this is protecting, you know, not only the engine, but the lift pump of the engine. Um, any of the metals that sit underneath the water on the engine are protected by this one zinc here. So very, very important to replace this sink as needed. Uh, make sure you have good protection there. Uh, the way that this zinc or anode is protecting the motor is through this cable right here. So if you do replace this anode by removing these four bolts, uh, make sure that when you reinstall, this cable here is, is connected. Um, otherwise that zinc or that anode is just sitting in the water and it's not protecting the engine. So on this one, we're showing a picture of a boat that's gone uh, a little bit too long uh, without replacing their anodes. So you can see that the, uh, the trim tab anode here is to maybe, you know, 15, 20% left. Uh, probably not doing much there to protect the, uh, the trim tab at that point. And that's why you're starting to see some of the electrolysis spread over to the, um, the trim tab itself. Uh, same with the propeller over on the right here. This is a case where maybe they relied on that single Allen bolt to hold the anode in place. As that anode deteriorated, uh, out came the, uh, the zinc, but also the, uh, the bolt itself. So um, this one, once again, gone a little bit too long. Do we have any questions? I think, Tim, let's see if any of these kind of go. I, I save quite a few that will answer live at the end of the uh, uh, presentation, but there's a couple on, um, yeah, here's one, a frequent flashing depth on his uh, Ranger 23. And yeah. I read somewhere transducer should be submerged uh, in liquid. How do I access this on the 23? So the 23, 25, 27, Cutwater 24, uh, all those models, it's right below your step that leads down into the V-berth. So if you remove the step right by where the shower drain box is at that we talked about last week, uh, you'll see your transducer right below the, uh, the step there. Um, as far as the flashing depth, anytime you're getting a flashing depth reading, it means the transducer is working. It just cannot find the bottom. So it could be uh, that either you're moving too fast, you're in too deep a water, um, or it's, you know, maybe a bottom where it just can't get a good reading off the bottom. And then here's one from uh, Rick about uh, what about transducers attached to the stern? And I, I know why we don't do them attached to the stern, but you, do you know that one, Tim? Yeah, a lot of times if you do a, a transom man, uh, mounted transducer, uh, you'll get interference, especially like on an outboard boat or even some of our inboard boats. It has all the prop wash and all the, um, you know, the water moving around back there from the engines. Uh, that's going to give you a lot of interference. So we try to get the transducers up as far forward as possible. Uh, that way you have nice clean water that doesn't interfere with the transducer reading. And then this one, uh, this is a good one, Tim, and regarding to uh, anodes is they should last at least 50% six, six, for six months in salt. And I, that's not always true, um, right. but you can maybe dive into that a little bit deeper of why that would be. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've heard of boats where they need to do um, anodes every three months. You know, it really depends, like I said, on your, your marina. Uh, it depends on your neighbor's boats. If their boat is putting off a, a you know, a ton of stray of electricity through the water, um, you know, the marina, depending on how well their electrical system is up to date, how well it's protected and isolated, 
Um, there are a lot of factors there. That's why it's so important to, to monitor your zincs. There are also ways to measure how much electrolysis is in the water. Um, I think, Andrew, you did a, a test where you actually went down to Des Moines and uh, using a fluke vote, was it a fluke or was it a, an actual testing kit? No, it's a test kit that was sold from uh, uh, boat zincs, but it's basically a probe that you stick in the water to measure, you know, what the boat's doing. And a lot of the time you can measure, um, you know, and see that the boat is, is well protected, but once you plug into power, and specifically a lot of the marinas have, you know, their, their power's been in place for a long time, or there's a lot of old boats sitting around like you went into that shared ground, yeah. Um, where the galvanic isolator would really, really help prolong the life. And um, here's one more, Tim, that's, you know, would basically, we're getting a lot of questions on this of what type of anodes to run and, you know, in different types of water, salt water, fresh water. And I think a lot of that, I mean, even going through that, to me, there's a lot of discussion all over of whether magnesium's better or aluminum's better or zinc is better. Um, the, the most important thing is that the zincs are deteriorating as they should in whatever water you're in. You know, if you have a, a zinc in fresh water and it's not, and you see metal around the rest of the boat that maybe is looking bad, then you might want to change and find something that does deteriorate because that's the whole idea of those anodes of being sacrificial. You want the anodes to deteriorate before the metal that it's protecting. Yeah, if your anodes aren't deteriorating, then you have a problem. They should, they should be working. You know, you hear of people that want to prolong the lifespan of the anode, and I, I understand that, but um, that really means that it's not doing its job. And like Andrew said, it's starting to deteriorate some of those more expensive items um, underneath the boat, like your trim tabs, like your, your rudder. So, um, you know, if I get anywhere from six to, you know, nine months out of my, my anodes, I'm feeling pretty good about it. But yeah, there are a lot of different, um, you know, opinions on, on what type of anode to use in uh, different types of water. All right, we'll uh, save some more. We're getting uh, lots of questions that are coming in. So I think we'll, we'll continue this on even after um, after, and we'll try to answer as many of those as people want to actually, you know, if they want to stay around and hear. So we'll move on to uh, uh, Kenny's presentation. Kenny, take it away. Hey, thanks, Drew. You're welcome. I'm going to, I'm going to go uh, video off and I'm going to try to answer a lot of these while you're uh, talking there. Yeah, I think I need Tim to stop sharing real quick. Okay. There you go. Hey, thanks, bud. I'll do the, uh, the same. I'll help answer some questions here. Sounds good. We'll, we'll see you guys here in a bit. All right. You take care, Kenny. Okay. Bye, bye now. Um, all right. So, so trailering, um, you know, as you know, other than our 41, uh, all of our boats are trailerable. So we, we do get a ton of questions on, on trailering. So what we're going to run through is just, um, you know, your basic setup for going down the road. So, so you know, you always want to make sure once your once your truck is hooked up to the trailer, um, you know, you have running lights on the side of the trailer, you have brake lights, uh, you have turn signal lights. Um, it's best to do this if you have a, a you know partner or someone else with you that they can be behind the boat uh, and check the lights as you're checking them with the vehicle. But um, you know, before you go down the road, it's always good to make sure all of your lights are working properly. Another good thing to do is, um, I think you guys can see my cursor here, is up at the, uh, the bow here, you have the, the winch strap and then your safety chain. So you definitely want to make sure that both of those items are secure to the bow eye right here, like you can see in the picture. Um, and then also, uh, we have another picture off to the side. This is a 10-foot beam boat, but you want to make sure that you have tie-down straps on, on either side of the boat secure as well. Um, this is, uh, this is required um, that you have a, a secure load going down the road. Uh, if you have a, a 10 foot beam boat, you're going to need a oversized load permit, which you can see off to the side fits nicely on the uh, patio railing here. So for Washington, you need the sign on the back of the boat, you need the sign on the front of the truck. You'll also need um, side marker flags uh, and the permit needs to be in the vehicle. So 
The nice thing about Washington is you can get an annual permit if you are a trailer and oversized, but if you're uh, an eight and a half, um, you don't need to worry about, about getting a permit. But biggest thing is my lights are good, my straps secure, uh, my tie down straps are, are on in the rear as well. So um, up on top, you wanna make sure that any and all antennas are down, your VHF antenna's down, your mast is down in the stowed position. If you are trailering a, a command bridge, you wanna make sure that the command bridge is down in the stowed position and that any additional railing uh, has been taken down too. So, uh, you know, take the time, especially you don't, it's a lot easier to do it in the parking lot um, versus on the side of the freeway. So, you know, take the time, do the checks, make sure you have everything secure uh, in that stowed position because uh, it's not fun doing it on the side of the freeway. Um, which uh, I'm sure the other guys can attest to. So on our, uh, now these, now we're going through an easy loader trailer. That's what we supply from the factory. Um, so on our easy loader trailers, uh, we do an oil bath hub. So what we did is we actually drew a line here. So you can see the amount of oil that's in the hub. Uh, so two things we're checking here. One, we want to make sure, A, we do have, uh, oil in that hub before we get underway or before we go down the road. And then we want to make sure that it's, it's clear and that it's not milky. Uh, if you look and are doing your inspection and find that these are milky in any way, uh, that means that there's water intrusion. So you'll want to get that uh, repaired or, you know, get, uh, get it flushed out, put new oil uh, in the hub. They, uh, e Easy Loader does recommend um, that uh, every three years you do, regardless of how, how the oil looks, uh, that you do replace the fluid that's in there. Uh, same thing if you did have a, a grease hub. Um, you know, every three years they want to have that, that swapped out. Um, one other thing that uh, is probably one of the more important things is your tire pressure. Um, it's good to check with the gauge uh, your tire pressure on all of your tires. Uh, and then also your spare. I mean, that, that's your backup. Um, so if something happens and you do blow a tire, uh, you don't want your spare to be, be flat. Um, uh, you know, Tim has a good story about uh, not having a spare. So I'll let him share that one later on. Um, and then on the, uh, tandem and triple axle trailers, uh, it's good to check all of your, your lug nuts here to make sure they're at the proper torque spec. So on all of these, they want 110 foot pounds. So, you know, it's good to do this stuff as, as often as you can. You know, my biggest thing is, especially on longer trips, um, you know, it's really good to take the time and, and check all these things out before, before you go down the road. Uh, and then when you do have an empty trailer, no boat on it, uh, you can take and actually shake and wiggle the, the wheel to make sure that there's no play in that bearing. So another good thing to periodically check, especially if you go launch the boat, um, you know, take a couple of minutes, just check those uh, as you go park your truck. And then on our uh, easy loader trailers, we actually use electric over hydraulic brakes. So we do not have a, a surge brake or uh, an actual tongue that's compressing to engage our brakes. Uh, we have a brake controller uh, in the vehicle. So some of the newer trucks, you actually have a, um, a, a standard brake controller. If you have an older truck, you might have to get an aftermarket brake controller put in. Uh, but regardless, uh, it's important to know the gain of, of what the, the brakes are engaging at. So for, for a heavier haul, meaning that the boat's there, uh, you want that gain turned up. And, and any of the brake uh, controller manufacturers uh, will have a sequence or steps on how to properly adjust the gain. Uh, when I have a boat on, I'm gonna have the gain higher because I have a heavier load. If I'm just hauling the trailer with no boat, I'm gonna turn the gain down. That way my brakes aren't engaging as much when either I hit the pedal, the brake pedal, or if I physically just uh, squeeze the lever and engage the brake uh, in the cab. So it, it's good to, uh, to get that properly adjusted. Then it's also good to check your, uh, your brake fluid. So here uh, we have a picture of um, the, uh, the brake fluid. We have our cap off here. You can see the fluids at the top one with the cap on. So you wanna check that as well before, before you're doing any trips. Um, it, uh, it's just one of those easy things to check and trust me, you don't wanna go down the road without, uh, without having brakes. And then another service item uh, is the calipers. 
So again, every three years, those should be uh, dropped, inspected, uh, and cleaned as needed. So if, uh, if you're not too handy or, or don't feel like tackling that project, it's, uh, it's good just to take it into a service yard to have them kind of just do a good once over before, uh, before continuing on. And then here we have a little bit closer view of our winch strap. So this is, uh, again, what's attaching to the bow eye. So you can see the strap with the hook here. Um, the most important thing is you're not using this entire strap. I mean, this strap will run all the way almost to the end of the trailer, but you know, you're typically using the first you know, two, maybe three feet. And I just don't wanna see uh, the strap starting to fray or, uh, or have any tears in it, um, especially with, uh, with you know, launching and retrieving. You wanna make sure that your strap is, uh, is in good condition. And then along with that is this actually bolts onto the trailer. So it's good to check your hardware, make sure that that is secure and, and it's not loose. I mean, that's one of the main things bringing the boat uh, on and off of the trailer. So with that, you can also see we have our spare tire here. Um, you know, I know we're checking tire pressure, but then we also wanna make sure, especially a lot of our customers, you know, they, they leave the boat in the, the water for six months and, the trailer stored and, and typically it's in the summertime. So, you know, this is out in the elements. So, you know, during that time when you're doing the rest of the checks, um, it's good to check all of your tires, check your spare, make sure you don't have any, you know, cracking, uh, dry rot actually in the tire. Um, you know, you can get covers for these. So if it's gonna sit out in the elements, um, it's good to protect, uh, protect your tires as well while it's, uh, while it's sitting there and you're having fun boating. And then we're going to go through uh, windless here. Uh, do you guys have any questions on trailering that popped up I need to answer? Mm, I haven't got down that far in the questions yet, but uh, I don't think we've had a ton. Uh, motor support recommended uh, when trailering for the outboard? Yeah, so those, all, the, all the outboards come with what we call a shock absorber. Um, so yeah, you'll want to make sure that before you, you get underway with any of the outboards, you have that shock absorber uh, installed. Okay, another one here is um, Larry with his 27. He says it always rolls back or moves back about four to six inches mm -hmm. uh, from the roller whenever mm -hmm. he's pulling the boat out of the water. Yep. So if, if you think about how the, the trailer is positioned on the ramp and then, you know, your boat's driving up and, and you know, you'll have it tight at the ramp. Well, by the time you pull out, you know, that, that stern kind of sits down um, as, as you become level. So a couple different things is, you know, don't go all the way out of the water yet. Go, you know, a couple feet and then you can usually crank it up or, or motor up a little further. Um, if you do, you know, have that little bit of a gap, you can, uh, you know, once you're on flat land, do a little brake tap and slide the boat forward. But yeah, no matter what, um, when, when the, when you're, retrieving the the boat onto the trailer you're always going to have that gap um, you're going to have to do a little bit of adjustment as you're coming out of the water okay maybe we'll do one more here and i'll let you keep rolling uh nancy has yeah. to know if um if you're hauling a 10 foot wide boat do you need to go through the scales it's a great question um i want to say in washington for a private party it's it's not required but on your permit it'll it'll list all the times you can haul your boat you know as far as daylight hours and um you know going especially going through like seattle but um you know it's it, uh it, it'll walk you through step by step if they if they require especially if you go out of state you know some other states will uh, might have different um regulations so if you're to get trip permits, they'll on the form on your permit, it'll say everything you need to do. Absolutely, and definitely check your uh, your state wherever you're at. But yeah, I think that was um, that was most of them on trailering for now. I think Kenny. So we'll let you keep okay. rolling here. Cool. So we're gonna hit uh, your windlass. Um, now this is we're not gonna get into too much as far as you know anchoring types and scope and all that. We're gonna go through just basic safety functions. Um, you know, this, uh, this is something that we do get a lot of questions on and just kind of operation on of best practice. So we're gonna run through just some basics right now. So the biggest thing is, is when I'm anchoring, um, I wanna know what depth I'm in, you know, how, how deep is it? 
Um, and then also, especially for, for us in the sound, um, you know, we have a, a 12 foot tidal swing. So you want to also see, okay, as I'm anchoring, what's my current depth, you know, where am I at? But then also what's the rest of the day look like and then into the next day. So, you know, again, on that, uh, that Garmin 101 uh, webinar we did, which was just magnificent information. Um, it, it talks about, uh, you know, how to check tides um, and then also on your chart just to see the different color contrast between uh, your green being land, your baby blue being really shallow water, and then your white being uh, the, your deeper water. So um, it's good just to note kind of what your tidal swing is going to be when you're anchoring. Uh, we do recommend um, for a couple reasons to, to leave your engine running when you're launching and retrieving. Uh, the biggest reason is it keeps your batteries charged. So this motor has, just like your thrusters, has a pretty big draw on it. So it's, it's good to have your engine running, keep your batteries charged, but, but also for maneuverability. Um, if I have other boats around me, I don't want to be drifting into them. Um, and especially when I'm retrieving my anchor, uh, I don't want to be drifting into them, not have my engine on and, and not be able to kind of motor away. So for, for that reason, um, it's good to have your, your engine running. Um, if I'm trying to kind of hold position too, you know, have my thrusters on as I'm deploying the anchor and, and even retrieving it at times, depending on, on how tight of quarters I'm in. Um, you do have two locations to operate the windlass. So you can see here, you'll have your foot switches um, off to the side. So you'll have your up and down. Now, these are caps. You, you do have to flip the cap up uh, to get to the foot uh, switch portion. Um, and then at the helm, you have your, your up and down as well. So, you know, typically for me, I, I always like to be on the bow when I retrieve. Um, that allows me to see my anchor and chain as it's coming up. I can make sure it's coiling up in the locker nicely, uh, but then also make sure I don't have a bunch of debris uh, physically on my anchor as I'm, as I'm bringing it up. Uh, all of our boats, we do supply uh, this windlass tool that you can see here. So the, the tool is in the, the clutch right now. So the clutch is what you can tighten and loosen. Uh, this will allow, if you have any slippage coming, you know, say you have a lot of scope out or, you know, a bigger anchor and you're in some current and, and you're trying to, to retrieve, uh, you know, you will want to tighten that clutch down. So this is, this is the tool in the clutch right now. Um, same thing for righty tidy, lefty loosey. So you wanna make sure that that guy is snug. And, and if you're retrieving your anchor and it slips, uh, you do wanna let a little bit out. It kind of lets it reset and then you can bring it back up. But it, uh, you know, this is typically stowed in the owner's bag or one of the top drawers. And then on the opposite side, uh, if you had to, for whatever reason, manually retrieve, the, uh, the anchor and chain, you could put it in there and uh, it, it would take you a little bit of time, but you could manually retrieve uh, the anchor with, with the tool as well. And then, you know, on, on all of our uh, anchor lockers, we install a, you know, we call it a bow eye, but, a, but an eye basically in the locker. And you want to make sure that the, this is the, the bitter end of the, uh, of the road that's properly tied off. Uh, the last thing you want to do is go and deploy an anchor and, you know, there goes your line and everything else. That's, that's not going to be fun. So, um, you know, always good to check, verify that that is tied off. Um, and then you can see here that as we retrieve, um, you know, the road is coiled up nicely and then the chain is, uh, is right on top of that. Um, you do, especially like for us in, in the sound and salt water, or anyone else in salt water, um, you do want to rinse this out periodically. We do have a, a anchor locker drain that'll allow the water to discharge overboard. Uh, so, you know, you do want to rinse this guy out uh, when you're, when you're done anchoring, especially if you had muddy conditions and, you know, salt build up it. Uh, I usually just open up that hatch and, uh, and give it a good rinse when I'm, when I'm done. The, uh, the biggest thing uh, too is, um, yeah, you know, there's not much in the locker, but if, if you are, um, you know, retrieving, or I guess you say launching, you want to make sure that the, the trailer harness, because all of our um, trailers do come equipped with a harness to, to plug in for lights on the boat, 
uh, and that's stowed in this locker. You want to make sure that that harness is, is out of the way, especially deploying. You don't want that to get wrapped up. So um, it's good to make sure that, you know, that is clear. And, and on, the, uh, on the foot switches especially, I mean, that, use them as such. I mean, they're foot switches. I'm going to step on those. Um, I definitely don't want any, any fingers, um, you know, hair, hoodie strings, you know, any, I don't want to be hunched over this since I'm launching and retrieving. Uh, I know I had one orientation where one of our customers was, her hair was dangling over there and she, she probably thought I was going to choke her out or something, but I just more grabbing the hair before they, before they operated. So you want to make sure everything is clear here. And, and you know, as you just kind of hang over the bow, um, hit the foot switches and, and watches it's coming, uh, coming up and down. So just something to kind of note as you're using that. I mean, you, you are okay to step on those switches. And then lastly, what we have here is, this is the thermal breaker for the windlass. Um, this is gonna be mounted in, in a few different locations um, throughout the boat, um, typically, closer at the helm. So this is, I wanna say this is a 31, so it's behind the helm. Uh, and you'll see it says windlass. So the set position, you'll see that this yellow arm will, is flipped up. So the set position means we have power going to the motor. If for whatever reason it was tripped, you'd see that yellow arm flipped down. So we wouldn't have power. So if we were to hit our foot switches or, or hit our switches at the helm, uh, we wouldn't have any power to the motor. If, if you press on the red button here, it'll actually uh, manually trip the breaker so you can always test it. Uh, and then you can just flip it up back to the set position uh, and that will allow you to have power. So, you know, for, for those of you who are anchoring, you know, often or, or wanna get into doing more anchoring, um, it, it's really good to know, make sure you know where that breaker is because that's gonna save you uh, a whole lot of headache knowing that if, if you just have a trip breaker, how easy it is just to reset it. So. Um, that's kind of a close-up picture on a, on a 31 of where the, the thermal breaker is located. Any questions? Okay, so do we want to handle some of the, um, the trailering questions now, or do we want to open this up to our, our overall Q&A? If there's... Trailer yeah. ones, we can hit a couple of trailers. Well, a couple, I think we hit at the bottom here, Andrew, for uh, for answer. Was Laura asking about uh, truck sizes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't use Tim's truck. It's two-wheel drive. It's four-wheel drive, just so everybody knows. <laughs> it just looks like it's two-wheel drive. R riding a wheelie going down the road with the boat behind it. It's a nice truck. Um, um, so there was, what was the one um, that, that I had answer live? Um, Tim, I think I might. Uh, yeah, I think we can go. Is that the end of your uh, presentation, Kenny? That's the last one. So Cynthia was asking about a windless breaker on the R29. All of our boats will have a, a windless breaker. Um, on your boat, it's going to be in that same location right behind the, uh, the main helm there. Yep. So there's there's several questions I think that we've uh, that we have gone through maybe in some of the other ones, but I'll kind of start at the bottom. Maybe we can kind of rotate Tim and Kenny just going through. So anybody that wants to stay or listen to um, these ones, we'll we'll go through it and uh, see what we can get through. There's quite a few. So um, you answered the um, you answered the windless breaker one, right? Tim? Yep, we answered yeah, that Yeah, on the 29. Yep. You can just get rid of, there you go. So, all right. Um, so most, I, we're getting a lot of windless breaker where are they at. Almost all the time, they're behind the dash. So usually every model will have some cabinet that opens up on a 302 or a 29. There's a mirror in the head that you open up and you can access that windless breaker. Um, that's there. And then there's another one um, that comes in completely a little bit off. It doesn't have a lot of these are kind of random. So this one, I, I do get this a lot. And we covered it in webinar number one um, from Bruce about the uh, inverter. It, there, 
we get it. If I turn off the Kisse inverter, will the batteries still charge from the solar panel and or shore power? And no, um, it, they'll charge from shore power as long, or I'm sorry, from the solar panel if you have sun. Um, and so, yes, that, that will work. If you turn off on this specific boat, he owns a Ranger 31. The Kisse inverter is also a battery charger. So when you plug into power, it becomes a battery charger. So if you turn that off, you will not charge batteries. So you need to note if you have a combination charger inverter or if you have a standalone charger. And a standalone charger would be on uh, models like a 23 Ranger, a 24 Cutwater, a 27 uh, Ranger. Those are all, most of them, there are some, you know, older versions that had combination units. So it's just good to note, um, you know, what, which brand you have. So, you know, the operation. Um, and then Kenny, one from John, what would cause the breaker to trip? Yeah, I saw that one. So if it was like, like anything, if you had too much load, if, if you're retrieving, you know, you have, it, it's, to protect the system, you're going to have a fuse or you're going to have a breaker. So just like your thrusters, if you use the thrusters too much, you have the potential to blow the fuse. This is the same principle. You just have a breaker that now you can manually reset. So if you find yourself not being able to retrieve the anchor, um, you know, it's best to drive up or drive closer to it uh, to, to bring it in. If, if, you know, you can do that and then slowly bring it in with the switch at the helm, um, you'll, probably have a much better success rate before you trip that breaker again. So it's the breaker is there really just to protect the motor and the rest of the system from, uh, from any kind of damage or overload. And on that same topic, another one asked, do you care if they trip that breaker on the windlass if they're not using it? I mean, I just have mine on just so it's ready. I don't think it's going to hurt anything being on or off. Uh, I've, I've never had the practice or, or I've ever worried about turning that off when I'm, you know, away from the boat or, you know, especially even if I'm moored somewhere, I just usually have it, have it ready, uh, so that I don't have to go hunt for it or move stuff, you know, just have it set and ready to go. Okay, perfect. And this, this one I'll, I'll answer, um, from Rich, they're going to keep, uh, which is a good kind of a winter time question. They're going to keep their boat moored on a buoy. Is there anything special you recommend during uh, recommend doing during the winter time? And you know anything if it's on a buoy, you know chances are you don't have power. And if you don't have power, there's no way to run a heater or keep things from freezing. But being in the water, and I know that you use it in the Northwest, yeah, you know 99% of the time the water is going to keep things thawed out when your boat sits in there so you're not going to risk freezing but there are components that you might risk freezing like a, a, a transom shower or things like that that you might want to winterize um, you know because a lot of people still want to use their boats on you know during during the winter and so it's not a bad, uh, bad idea maybe to winterize those specific components so you can still take your boat out. But, and then short of that, I mean, there's lots of things that you can do. Like, you know, if you're going to keep it on a mooring buoy, you're not going to want to have uh, all your power on. So you're probably going to have to keep your refrigerator empty um, so your batteries remain charged and things like that. Uh, and then here's another one. Kenny, I'll put this one on to you. I have a 23 on a trailer. Is it okay to remove the fuse from the bilge pump? Yeah, I think, I think if you do that, you know, remove your, your hot fuse devices. Um, it, it's okay. What we always do is get a Ziploc bag and, you know, we'll tape all of those loose fuses to the steering wheel. Um, that way you don't forget before you launch the boat again. Um, I, you know, there's, there's, the biggest thing is the power draw, which I'm guessing is why they want to remove them. You know, maybe they don't have power uh, where the boat's sitting on the trailer for an extended period of time. So it's okay to do that. Um, but again, just make sure you, you tape them with a Ziploc to the steering wheel and that will remind you to put them back in before you get underway. Okay, perfect. I'll get this one to Tim uh, from Skip on a Cutwater 24, the bow thruster. 
uh, had sheared a pin a couple times and he wants to know if the Lumar bow thruster uses a snap ring and then we might give him some suggestions of how to prevent that uh, that shear pin from breaking. Yeah, yeah, I think I read he said his was falling out, but um, what the Lumars do is they actually use a zip tie uh, just to hold the, the shear pin in place. It's not actually uh, keeping the pin from breaking, but uh, when you put the new pin in there, uh, you'll see in, I think it's page 12 of their manual that came with the boat, um, all they do is simply wrap a zip tie around that pin to keep it in place from falling out. Um, on the larger boats with the, um, the bow and the stern thrusters, they do have a, uh, a snap ring that keeps that pin in place. On any of the, uh, the Lumar thrusters, it's going to be that zip tie, once again, page 12. Um, as far as avoiding uh, snapping a shear pin, the best thing you can do operationally is try not to switch directions too quickly. So if you're you know, thrustering the port, uh, give it a brief second between you try to slam it back over to starboard. Otherwise, all the, you know, all the tension that's spinning the prop one way tries to force the other way. Um, it's about the only way that you as an operator can, can snap that pin. Um, also, of course, debris and that kind of thing floating into the thruster tubes will, will do that. But um, as far as, you know, what you can do to, to prevent that, try not to, to, you know, change direction too quickly. Yeah, and just to add to that, I always tell people, you know, specifically on the diesel inboards because they have a, a stern thruster, or maybe even on a, a Cutwater 302 or 32 that have a stern thruster with them, is you, you really shouldn't be using the thruster for any reason other than docking. And, you know, I always tell people, make sure your engine's in neutral before you start because people, I see people coming out of the marina and they need to make a sharp turn instead of maybe putting it in neutral or getting positioned right. They'll use their thrusters a lot to help turning out or yeah. they have any gear coming into the dock and they're and you're you're fighting the force of a propeller, especially on a on a on a uh, diesel. You're fighting that 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 torque on the prop and the thruster at the same time. So you use them while your engine is in neutral and only use them for docking. Yeah, the slower think, you're going, the more that, you know, your thrusters are going to be able to affect the boat. And I usually turn them off on the, um, you know, any of the outboard boats that you have to physically turn your thruster off. That way you don't accidentally hit it when you're going, you know, 30 miles an hour. Yeah, that's a, here's another one for you, Tim, uh, on a Volvo D4. Is it worth adding a freshwater flush to an inboard freshwater cooled Volvo? Uh, absolutely not. You know, it's so easy to flush those motors. Um, I think we might have covered it a little bit in one of the previous seminars, but basically all you do is you close your valve to the sea strainer, pull the strainer cap off, and using a garden hose, you can feed water right into the motor. Um, this is also where you would want to add any, you know, salt away product, or if you're trying to winterize the, the engine in the wintertime, um, you can pour the pink RV antifreeze right down the strainer there with the ball valve closed. Uh, start the motor and then just run the engine until you see that uh, pink RV antifreeze e exiting the side of the exhaust. Perfect. And I'll answer this one from Harold on a uh, Cutwater 24. Uh, the Ritchie Compass, the Garmin GPS, and Autopilot disagree. Um, the Ritchie Compass, what we, we do go through this a lot on our deliveries, and the Ritchie Compass um, is something that it's, it's a mechanical or manual compass and it's not going to read identical to your electronic compasses. So when you get into, there is a way, um, you know, to calibrate a Ritchie compass. I've never done it, but they use a non-magnetic uh, screwdriver to adjust. I, I, I don't really mess with that. I know there's gonna be deviation depending on where you're at in the country. Um, Garmin GPS, when you're reading that, that's gonna read as your GPS heading or your chart over ground. Um, and if you're, if that and your autopilot disagree uh, more than, I usually say about 10 degrees, then you should yeah. calibrate. In 99% of the time, what I see, there's several things to autopilots that you have to be cautious of. And number one, the first thing, not knowing where uh, Harold keeps his boat, but chances are the autopilot may not have been calibrated. So, you know, when you take delivery, we're supposed to go through um, on the orientation to actually calibrate 
uh, the autopilot or before it, uh, really before the orientation, we should calibrate those. And then we go through a brief how to calibrate with our owners, but you'll want to run through an autopilot calibration. And that might be something for our next webinar. It, Garmin doesn't really, they don't suggest that it goes in the customer's hands because there's many ways to mess up the calibration, but there's also ways to, you know, redo it. But chances are with that, I would recalibrate the autopilot, go through those steps. You have to be in the water and you need to be in calm water to do it. Once you calibrate, if you, um, um, you have radar or other things, then everything should line up much closer. And the other thing you'll want to make sure is note, where is your autopilot compass? And a lot of the time, like going through the NEMA 2000 list or things like that, it'll show you, you know, what brand you have. For instance, on the one I was looking at, I think it was a Reactor 40. You, you don't want to put tools and metal and things next to that. Sometimes, you know, they're in a 31, they're behind a drawer and you don't, you know, you want to make sure that you keep your metal away from that. We go through that with our owners too, but keep metal away from the compass, make sure it's uh, um, calibrated and it should work good. And then uh, the other question to it, there's a few, you know, the depth reading seems to be off by up to a hundred yards. Um, and that's again, you know, it, the, it could be because the autopilot's not calibrated, the GPS and chart is not showing exactly where your vessel is. So once you calibrate it, it should also solve um, that problem. And it will also solve your third question about the autopilot being engaged with a heading hold at random times and speeds. It'll make a hard turn. Um, and it's, it's most, it, uh, again, I'm, 99.9% .9 sure it's calibration and settings within your autopilot on that. Yeah, and especially I, if, they're, if they're trailering too, you know, you, you might have to recalibrate if you're going coast to coast yep. and, um, you know, you have that plotter off the entire time and it's going to take one a little bit to find itself. And then two, um, you, you probably will have to calibrate. And that's what Andrew's talking about is, you know, prior to delivery or, or you know, especially on the East Coast that, you know, these go and get spun and then they should line up. Yeah, and this one's kind of on the same uh, topic. I have to, I frequently have to run my sea trial wizard to get the boat icon to match my track. So he's, uh, he is going in and calibrating, um, you know, the autopilot. And the one thing I have talked to Garmin about is some of the boats that had the Reactor 30 they were sending out reactor 40s to replace those that seem to hold better. And so I would suggest on that, that uh, go to your NEMA 2000 list, find out what reactor you have with the autopilot turned on, and then call Garmin and see, and I'll bet you they'll send you a reactor 40 that will really help with that. And then also make sure you have the latest updates again uh, in your chart plotter. What, um, one thing with that one too, Andrew, yeah. it, did you, did that one go away? Yes. It, it looked like they were just doing the sea trial wizard. It would be probably mm -hmm. good to do the dock side. Um, that, that could be throwing it off too if those aren't set up properly. So you'll have a dock side and then a sea trial. So it'd be good to check both when you're doing your, your autopilot calibration, which I, I'm, I'm guessing in the future here, we're going to have a, a video on how to run through all of those, but it'd be good to check both. And they're both in the wizards. They're right next to each other. Yep. Agreed. And we have another one. I'll take this one too. If I want to upgrade my 7212, is it uh, as simple as plug and play? And not always. And the main reason is, is the size. So if you're ever upgrading or changing a chart plotter, you want to verify the cutout dimensions to figure out if it'll actually fit. Um, and two, that you have room in the dash. The other part about it, is a lot of the time as you go to newer units, um, sonar or transducers like Tim talked about earlier, they change the style of plugs, the power changes the style. So I would get personally, if you're not really familiar with all the different electronics, I would work with uh, someone that is and have them kind of plot out, lay out a, an upgrade for you to see if you do want to change those out. But a 7212 is a, is a great unit, so. 
Um, this one for Tim, uh, Volvo Penta engine anodes. When did Volvo quit using the two anodes? Yeah, so they don't have a, um, a serial number breakdown, but it was right about 2016 um, where they moved from two engine anodes to one. And then uh, towards the latter part of that year, they went down to, to no anodes. So I would say anything uh, 2017 and newer wouldn't have any anodes at all, um, but definitely a good idea to get on uh, to your boat and ensure that you don't have either one or, or both. And then Kenny, do you want to talk about maybe why you don't use the anchor drift alarm since that was, I think, part of webinar two, your, uh, your, the greatest webinar the ever done. <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable, Kenny. Um, maybe why you wouldn't use an anchor drift alarm on the Garmin versus an app. Yeah, so it, it, it does take a lot of power. Um, I, I know you can, if you're having the alarm on, you can minimize that by dimming your screen. Um, but again, your chart plotter is still on all night. And, and the, the biggest draw is, you know, your GPS is on the entire time. So you can do a little bit of power management by dimming the screen. But with, with so many apps out there um, and, you know, for the amount of anchoring we do, uh, it's just as easy to throw one on an app. You can set the exact same parameters you would on the Garmin. Um, and it's going to be a lot less draw uh, using it with your phone versus using the Garmin. So it, uh, you know, we always kind of recommend and find it easier just to use and uh, find an app to, uh, to use. And that way you're not using as much uh, battery power. You're just using your, your phone at that point. Um. Perfect. Here's a couple for you on anchor, Kenny. Mm -hmm. uh, is it necessary to tie off the anchor road before the windlass to keep the pressure off the windlass gears? So you all of the all of our models will have a cleat um, which you can tie off when anchoring. So you'll you'll want to tie that off, and we absolutely do uh, tie it off once your anchor is set. Um, that way, one, yeah, it takes the pressure off, but two, uh, it's not going to slip overnight. You're not going to potentially have the rest of your road come out. So, you know, a lot of times once we have the anchor set and we're happy that we're holding position, um, you know, we'll let another five feet out or so take up the slack and then, uh, tie it off to that cleat and then let that cleat, uh, take the load and not have the windless, uh, motor take the load. And I think that's more for, for overnight usage especially um you know if you're if you're just hanging out having a quick lunch or something um you know it's probably you know if you're not going to sleep basically you'll, you'll know if you're drifting um if uh, if you guys are hanging out but you know more so if you're sleeping um yeah we definitely recommend tying off to that cleat that's up there okay perfect we'll do a couple more because we're going to be going on two hours on this so we'll we'll keep uh, uh tim um, do you need to prep anything on a, um, when you replace anodes? Do you just like, you know, corrosion, is it good to wire brush it or what yeah. would you? Yeah, it's always a good opportunity to clean, especially if you have the boat out of the water, but uh, you definitely want to remove all of the existing anode. So, you know, if you have to use a wire brush or a scraper to, to clean that surface, you know, if you're like me, you're going to clean everything around that area. Uh, that you can get your hands on uh, before you put the boat back in the water. So yeah, absolutely remove all of the old anode, but also, um, you know, clean up a little bit below where that anode sits. Yep, perfect. And then um, one, one, I'll answer this just because I, I do it. Best way to clear the scuppers. And it, you know, a lot of the time things grow you know, on the scuppers or the base or whatever, you get dirt and stuff in there. The number one thing I would do if you have, all of our boats have scuppers other than a 21, but I would take the screens out of the scupper. That's the, they all pop out with an insert. That's the number one. And when I take them out, I throw them in the garbage. I would never put them back in. They come with the screen, but the screen plugs so easily that it can uh, make your scuppers not work. And then the best, best way to clear them, 99%, uh, maybe 100% of our boats tee in. So typically you might have two on the port uh, and then two on the starboard. I usually take like a towel 
and I'll go from the back drain, I'll put a rag in there, just kind of plug it, and then I'll force water in that front drain, that the, the same side it's teed to, and just make sure that I get a lot of pressure and water through there that clean everything that's on the back or the area you can't reach if your boat's in the water. And then I just repeat that on both sides and it works really well. Um, and then I'll answer this one quickly too, um, from Dave. I removed the anode from the heat exchanger. Whoa. Yeah, there. What was that there? Sam. Yeah, all right, come on, Sam. Geez, Sam, yeah. we're almost done. Yeah, Sam, just give us a minute, please. Yes, I'm going to Sam. I removed. I removed the anode from the heat exchanger. It was totally gone. I had a replacement without the bolt. I epoxied it in place. I'm guessing that was on a Yanmar. I remember some of the older uh, BY style Yanmars that they sold the bolt and zinc as one part um, instead of having basically a, a screw in type of pencil zinc. So I, I would not epoxy it because chances are the epoxy separating connection between the anode. Um, and I would order the right zinc that comes with, it's a bolt and zinc that's attached um, to that. Um, and then Kenny, real quick on a 30, do you trust the cleat, small cleat in front? He's worried he's going to tear it off. Um, maybe talk about the backing and how strong our cleats are. Yeah. So all, all of the cleats, uh, your dealer's calling me, Andrew. Hey, he's called me five times. Um, yeah. <laughs> all, all the cleats are through bolted and we do, uh, you know, big fender washers behind there. So there's a lot of stiffening actually in the layup, but then the fact that we also threw a bolt um, and then add those fender washers in. Uh, I mean, you, you, when we actually load the boats onto trailers or trucks, we pick from the two stern eyes and we pick from the bow eye, the entire boat. So it, and it's the same process in the layup as far as on those bow and stern eyes. Uh, the, the cleat is secured in the same fashion. So yeah, I, I definitely feel confident that that cleat's going to hold in place while, while you're anchored. And, and typically too, like when you're anchored, um, you're not in a, in a super exposed area. You know, you, you try to tend to find something that's, you know, out of a lot of current or, or weather exposure too. So, um, you know, just for us, we try to find some little holes somewhere and hang out, but um, I, I feel totally fine with that cleat up there holding the boat. Perfect. And just a quick one from John. He addressed me. Garmin, Garmin does support the AIS 300. They just don't sell it anymore. So if you can get an AIS 300, but chances are the 29 you're getting already has that. So shouldn't have anything to worry about there. And then real quick, autopilot compass on a 31. Where is it located? Uh, almost all the time it's located underneath your sliding drawers. So you remove the sliding, open up those teak louvered cabinets, uh, pull the sliding drawer out, and then you can look back there and you'll be able to see the uh, autopilot compass. And then you'll know what drawer not to put the metal in. Lots of questions on uh, anno time frame. Um, and like I said in the presentation, you know, you're really doing that more at 50%. Unfortunately, there's no exact time frame that we can give you. It's all based on your location and your neighbor's boats. And then one uh, for you, Tim. Dale said you never showed him during training where the autopilot compass was. Dale, no, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I might have added a few lines in there, but he said- On the 23s, the there. autopilot mm -hmm. compass is uh, directly above the fuel tank. So inside of your center hatch, um, you know, we call it the engine room, but the center big hatch, if you pick that up face forward, you'll see the Garmin autopilot directly above the fuel tank. Um, on our Ranger 27s, that compass will be all the way up forward on the inboard side of the mid berth. Perfect. And let's see. There's one about the chain and the windlass, if that needs to be tied off, I can hit that one. Uh, yeah, I'd like to hit this one. It says, real quick, Kenny, it says, Andrew, you're the most knowledgeable guy ever. Kenny and Tim don't know much about this. I don't see that one here. On Funny. 1427. Andrew, you're the best. Well, Susan, you're the best. Thank you. 
and he will apologize to me. So are you going to answer that or is that more of a statement? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like to read. I like to put in, you know, kind of what, what, uh, my, how you think it should be. I noticed our viewers are starting to drop off as we're right, just, really just rambling. Fun. Let's go through, um, let's get to, to, uh, a, one more from each of us. Kenny, you were just yeah. going to answer something. Yeah. So the question was, um, uh, if you still have chain in the windlass once down, do you need to tie off the chain? Um, you know, they, they, they do make bridles and other chain support. Uh, for our package, typically you're going to have 50 feet of chain. Um, you know, going into, I think what would be a minimum scope would be a three to one. You know, I, I'm pretty much any anchoring scenario I've been in, I, I've gotten to that road section. Uh, you know, with the standard kits that we have on all of our boats. And, and, you know, we anchor every summer up in desolation. And, and I, I don't think any of us have ran into a scenario where we've been anchoring and we still have chain in the windlass. So, you know, you're, you're pretty much going to have that chain all 50 feet of it, um, depending on the size of the boat you have all the way out. So, you know, your, your scope being a, a minimum of three to one, you'll have that out. They, they, uh, the only time that that does get in, um, is a lot of the time in the south where they're in really shallow water. Yeah. And they are running chain where, you know, they, they might only have 10 feet, you know, and with the, I think he has a 302 and you kick the outboards up and it doesn't draw. So he, you know, you, it, and they don't have the tidal swings that we have. True. And that's where those snubbers and stuff you can add. And, and definitely if you are not getting all the way out, that, um, you should add the the snubbers and and everything to it just to take that that tension off. Hey, and one more, Kenny from Pauline. She just uh, Andrew is the best looking Ranger tug guy out there. Thank you, Pauline. Um, that is it all? What? Yeah, that's not what I see. I must be uh, seeing something different on my screen, but yeah, definitely the best looking and the coolest hat. And yes, that is a camo a camo Ranger tug hat. Let's let uh, Pauline. Can we stay on topic? Um, <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, another okay. question is about the windlass tool here. Um, you can use just a half inch ratchet wrench if your boat didn't have the windlass tool on board. Uh, yeah. That same square fitting that Kenny pointed out, you can use just a standard half inch ratchet. Any any ratchet out there. So if you don't have a tool on board, um, you know, use a regular ratchet in place. Yep. All right. Well, I think that uh, that's that's the longest running uh, <laughs> webinar we've done yet. So thanks for tuning in for that thirty minutes <laughs> as the prop turns. Yeah, we might <laughs> we might want to redo our uh, audio on that uh, as the prop for the next thirty to three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of good info. I learned a lot. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. No problem. All right. Okay. Thanks, thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll see you this afternoon. All, All right. right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.